This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 1958. Stocks, part three. Most people lose money in the market. By J.L. Collins of jlcollinsnh.com. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. Now let's get right to today's post as we optimize your life. Stocks, Part 3, Most People Lose Money in the Market by J.L. Collins of jlcollinsnh.com. So here we have this wonderful wealth building tool that relentlessly marches upward, but, and this is a major but, boy howdy is it a wild and unsettling ride. In Part 1 and Part 2, I presented you a very rosy view of the stock market and its wealth building potential. Everything I wrote is true, but this too is true. Most people lose money in the stock market. Here's why. Number one, we panic when times are tough and buy when the market is soaring. We buy high and sell low. This applies to all of us. It's the way humans are hardwired. We are psychologically unsuited to prosper in a volatile market. It takes an act of will and effort to understand, accept, and then change this destructive behavior. Here's a sobering fact. The vast majority of investors in mutual funds actually manage to get worse returns from their funds than the funds themselves generate and report. Let that little nugget sink in a moment. How can this be? We can't help trying to time the market and so jump in and out almost always at the wrong times. Here's what Warren Buffett has to say about this. Quote, the Dow started the last century at 66 and ended at 11,400. How could you lose money during a period like that? A lot of people did because they tried to dance in and out, end quote. Number two, we believe we can pick individual stocks. You can't pick winning stocks. Don't feel bad, I can't either, nor can more than 80% of most pros. Oh sure, occasionally we can, and oh my, what a heady feeling it is when it works. It's incredibly seductive. Picking a stock that soars is an intense and addictive high. The media and internet are filled with winning strategies that feed on this delusion. Last year, I spotted a trend and made 19% in four months on the five stocks I chose. Sigh, I still have this addiction. That's almost 60% annualized. This while the market was flat for the year. That's spectacular, if I do say so myself. It's also impossible to do year after year. Even slightly beating the index year after year is vanishingly difficult. Only a handful of investors have been able to modestly outpace it over time. Doing so made them superstars. That's why Warren Buffett, Michael Price, and Peter Lynch are household names. That's why I don't let my occasional win go to my head. That's why I let index funds do the heavy lifting in my portfolio. Number three, we believe we can pick winning mutual fund managers. Actively manage stock mutual funds, funds run by professional managers as opposed to index funds are a huge and highly profitable business. Profitable for the companies that run them. For the investors, not so much. So profitable are they, there are actually more mutual funds out there than there are stocks. You read that correctly. Yeah, I'm amazed too. There is so much money at stake. Investment companies are forever launching new funds while burying the ones that fail. The financial media is filled with stories of winning managers and funds and advertising from them. Past records are analyzed. Managers are interviewed. Companies like Morningstar are built around researching and ranking funds. The fact is only 20% of fund managers will beat the index over time. 80% will fail. 100% of them will charge you high fees to try. There's no predicting which will be in that rarefied 20%. Every fund prospectus carries this phrase, past results are not a guarantee of future performance. It's the most ignored sentence in the whole document 
It's also the most accurate. Here's a little trick the mutual fund companies employ. When one of their funds underperforms, they'll simply quietly close it and fold the assets into something doing better. The bad fund disappears and the company can continue to claim its funds are all stars. Cute. There's lots of money to be made with actively managed funds, just not by the investors. And number four, we play in the wrong end of the pool. Imagine you've just spent a few hours reading all the pithy posts here on JL Collins NH, as well you should. Richly deserving of a reward, you crack open a bottle of your favorite brew and pour it into a nice chilled glass. If you've done this before, you know that if you carefully pour it down the side, you'll wind up with a glass filled mostly with beer and a small foam head. Pour it fast and down the center and you can easily have a glass with a little beer and filled mostly with foam. Imagine now someone else has poured it for you, out of sight and into a solid mug you can't see through. You have no way of knowing how much is beer and how much is foam. That's the stock market. See, the stock market is really two very different things. Number one, it's the beer, the actual operating businesses we can own a part of. And number two, it's the foam the traded pieces of paper that furiously rise and fall in price moment to moment. This is the market of CNBC. This is the market of the daily stock market report. This is the market people are talking about when they liken Wall Street to Las Vegas. This is the market of the daily, weekly, monthly, yearly volatility that drives the average investor out the window and onto the ledge. This is the market that if you're smart and want to build wealth over time, you will absolutely ignore. When you look at the daily price of a stock, it's impossible to know how much is foam. That's why a company can plummet in value one day and soar the next. This is why CNBC routinely features experts, each impressively credentialed, confidently predicting where the market's going next while contradicting each other. It's all those traders competing to guess how much beer is actually in the glass and how much is foam. Over time, it's the beer that matters. It's the beer that's the real operating money-making underlying businesses beneath all that foam and froth that relentlessly drives the market ever higher. Understand too that what the media wants from these commenters is drama. No one's going to sit glued to their TV while some rational person talks about long-term investing. But get somebody to promise the Dow is going to 20,000 by year's end, or better yet, is on the verge of careening into the abyss? And brother, you've got ratings. But it's all just so much noise, and it doesn't matter to us. We're in it for the beer. You just listened to the post titled Stocks Part 3, Most People Lose Money in the Market by J.L. Collins of jlcollinsnh.com. I think this article really hits on why investing can be so challenging for many of us. In theory, it's really not that hard to throw your money into a low-fee total market index fund and just let it grow for decades until you're a millionaire. But in practice, our emotions get in the way. We're afraid of losing money. We're not confident in our investment strategy and we're influenced by how other people are investing. We have a desire to beat the market and putting aside money for a long period of time feels restrictive. I think it's also ingrained in us to always want more. We want more money, more success, more stuff. This tendency can make us both greedy and fearful which are two emotions that lead to poor financial decisions. I think if we can come to an understanding that money is only as valuable as our clarity on how we're gonna use it and our comfort level of how much is enough, we'll be in a much better position to navigate our emotions. There's a book on my list that I haven't read yet, but I've heard great things about. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, and it explores how personal biases and emotions play an important role in our financial decisions and how we can think more rationally about money. And that will do it for today. Have a great day. Thank you for listening. 
and I'll be back here reading to you tomorrow where your optimal life awaits.